God was looking for someone, someone who would love him and serve him all of their days, someone who would raise his children to love him and obey his laws. With God's all-seeing eye, he turned to a far-off city named Ur. They lived a man named Terah. Terah had three sons, Nahor, Haran, and Abram. Abram was the youngest. They must have had a very devoted mother who told them about God, about creation, about Adam and Eve and how they were banned from the beautiful garden. She must have told them how God had a plan to save them. Abram decided to give his heart unconditionally to God. He decided to live for him and obey his word. And through him, all the nations of the earth were blessed. We read in Hosea 9 verse 10, When I found Abram, Isaac and Jacob, I rejoiced over them, because it was like finding juicy grapes in a desert. Children learn to appreciate themselves and others from their parents. We show them We show them how to love, how to play, how to pray, how to trust and how to live. We are the primary teachers and we need to teach them about God and his great love. The first three years of a child are the most important for everything that follows. During these years you lay the foundation for the rest of their lives and a well-ordered Christian household is a powerful argument in the favor of a Christian religion. Christians can exert a mighty influence for good and can be a light in this dark world. Deuteronomy 6 verse 5 to 9 says, So love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and strength. Memorize his laws and tell them to your children over and over again. Talk about them all the time, whether you are at home or walking along the road or going to bed at night or getting up in the morning. Write down copies and tie them on the wrists and foreheads to help you obey them. Write these laws on the door frames of your homes and on your town gates. It's not easy today to raise children. It really is a challenge. But one day the hen and the pig went walking and the pig said to the hen, you know, you are very fortunate because you only make a contribution to breakfast. I have to make a complete sacrifice. When you become a parent, you have to make a complete sacrifice. A little boy was telling his teacher how a little brother or sister was on its way. He was so excited about this little one that was coming. And one day, his mother let him feel the movements inside of her. And then little Peter became very quiet. He didn't talk about his little brother or sister anymore. One day his teacher asked him, and he started to cry, and he said, I think my mommy ate him. Psalms 39 verse 13 and 14 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Dr. Bernie made a study of the unborn child. He wrote many books. And in this book, Pre-Parenting, he says, There's no doubt in my mind that at six months after conception, the unborn child is a sensing, feeling, aware and remembering human being. So we can teach our children long before they are born. We can touch uh, them and we can talk to them. It can happen. And this is very important what he says. He says a child conceived in love and cared for lovingly in the womb will benefit throughout his life. There is more on page 9 in the book that you can buy at Amazon. Discipline, an act of love. How do you feel about spanking? 
We spanked our children, and I wish we knew better. Who have you got spanked, and why do you remember about it? Christina said she head for the hills when she did something wrong. Jennifer says she remembers the wrath of the paddle. Lisa said the spankings were harsh, but it didn't teach her responsibility or obedience. She said it filled her with resentment, and it took years to drain. Her husband said he learned two things, to hide and to lie. Meredith said she was raised in the hardline biblical approach home. Spare the rot and spoil the child. Whenever she hears about snapping, it sends her into a panic. I believe discipline should be an act of love. Proverbs says, if you don't discipline your son, it shows that you don't love him. If you love your child, you will carefully correct him. What is the difference between discipline and punishment? Discipline is not the same as punishment. Discipline guides children to learn from their mistakes rather than to let them suffer for it. Respect and trust are the foundations of discipline. When you spank your children, they behave very quickly, but it does more harm than good. It can cause a long-lasting mark, and on page 23 in that same book, you will find a long list of all the negative effects that spanking has on children. It does not facilitate learning. Punishment shifts the focus from the lesson to be learned to who is in control. Spanking is a traumatic experience. Spanking doesn't make sense as a discipline. As a discipline. You can't teach children to behave better by making them feel worse. When children feel better, they behave better. Siegel and Bryanson in their No Drama Discipline book said, Children have the right to be free from any form of violence, especially at the hand of the people they trust mostly. Children come to their parents when they are scared. They are there when they have pain. They come to their parents. And when you hit them, it disorganizes them. It confuses them completely. Janusz Korczak said this, There are many terrible things in this world, but the worst is when a child is afraid of his father, mother or teacher. He fears them instead of loving and trusting them. In the book Education it says, Let the child and the youth be taught that every mistake, every fault, every difficulty conquered becomes a stepping stone to better and higher things, and mistakes are wonderful opportunities to learn. Timeouts are not good either, because they learn isolation and rejection. Mommy doesn't want me when I do something wrong, so she rejects me. And you know what? It gets wired into their brain. Rather, do time in. Sit with your child on the couch and talk lovingly. Time outs and punishment do a lot of emotional harm. Self-concept and punishment. A child with a negative self-esteem can display attitudes such as unmotivated, undisciplined, unable or uninterested. Children with a negative self-regard tend to be more destructive, more anxious, more stressed, and are more likely to manifest psychosomatic systems. symptoms. Criticism has a negative effect on the self-image. There are many sad stories outside of parents, mostly men, who criticize and harshly punish their children and loved ones. They batter their wives and girlfriends, and many of them hit their children. Almost all of them have been beaten when they were boys. They passed on the violence that they had endured, and some even defended. My daddy hit me with a belt, and there's nothing wrong with me. Cohen, a psychologist, says, explains that when they could break through their defensiveness and really talk about what it was like for them growing up, 
Many of them said that the worst part was not the violence, but the lack of tenderness from anybody. The book Education says love, tenderness, patience and self-control should be the law of our speech. Mercy and compassion will be blended with justice. It is better to err on the side of mercy than on the side of severity. Those I love, I correct and discipline. Discipline your children while they are young, otherwise you're just helping to destroy them. Discipline means it's positive. It is teaching, it is guiding and learning, and you have to do it consistently. Discipline is an act of love. Children want to belong and they want to have significance. The style of discipline we follow will influence the kind of adults our children will become. Control and support are two main aspects of parent-child relationships and the success or failure of it depends on these two. This includes how well also they will accept your values that you teach them, how much control you use, and how much support you provide determines the type of parenting style. Here are some different approaches, and sometimes we use combination of approaches, but then just in short, I'm just going to mention them quickly. In the book is a whole description of each one and also the effects that it has on your child, as well as the effects that it has on their spiritual development. The authoritarian approach looks something like this. The neglectful approach, very bad. The permissive approach, during the Second World War, it was very popular for parents to be permissive in their homes and their children. When they grew up, they became part of Hitler's youth. So it doesn't seem very positive. This is an approach, the authoritative approach that you can, I can recommend to you. It is something with positive results. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Even if they depart, they will come back. Children need the three R's. With rules, routine and responsibility, they cannot be fully without that. To be secure and become all that they can be. Rules give structure and make child rearing easier. They must be clear and everybody must understand them. Stick to the rules and be consistent. Just a few, not too many. If they are too many, they will confuse the children. When children are older, they can help make the rules. A rule that is ill-defined, not enforced or enforced only sporadically, is not a rule. A child becomes a victim and a prisoner of uncertainty. Here are some ideas of how you can draw up your rules. It's not something that you have to do, but it's, if it suits you, you can use it. Otherwise, create your own. We speak with respect and pleasant, pleasant voices. Never yell, kick, hit, or call one another names, or put one another down. We care about people's belongings. We ask permission to use someone's things and put them back when we are finished. We all help with the work in the home. It is everybody's duty. We always tell the truth. Follow directions without complaining and never argue with grown-ups. Make suggestions respectfully. We ask permission before we go somewhere. And we look for ways to be kind and helpful to each other. The smaller the child is, the fewer rules you will have. And when they are bigger, they can help you make the rules and then it's much easier for them to obey those rules. Why do children need a routine? Routines are what walls are to a house. They give a feeling of order. They organize and stabilize their lives. They give consistency, predictability, self-control, self-discipline and a healthy self-esteem. 
A study at the University of Albany found that children who had daily routines had fewer time management and attention problems as youth. The students who had more consistency in their daily lives as children had better self-control, reduced anxiety and depression, and fewer problems overall. How do you teach responsibility? You give children age-appropriate responsibilities to do. They help you in the yard. They help you when you make food. And you show them how to do their little jobs. Uh, emptying the, cr the, the trash cans. Taking out uh, things in the trash can when they're bigger. Things like that. You give them responsibility. Start children on the right path while they are young. And when they're old, they will not forget what they have been taught. Secure children have no desire to misbehave. Their discipline consists of connecting, rules, routine, and age-appropriate responsibilities. Discipline is a beautiful concept. It makes children capable, gives them confidence to live life to its fullest. By loving guidance, you equip them for life. The significant seven is a beautiful concept. The first three of these seven are perceptions, and the last four are skills that children need to develop. Researchers discovered people who are living effectively and outstanding in many walks of life were characterized by unusual strength and adequacy in the significant seven. Students who were weak in the development of these seven significant perceptions and skills are at high risk for serious problems facing the youth, such as drug abuse, teen pregnancy, suicide, delinquency, and gang involvement. Here are the first three. Strong perceptions of personal capabilities. I am capable. I can wash the dishes. I can sweep the floor. I can help my dad when he fixes the car. Strong perceptions of significance in relationships. I contribute in meaningful ways and I am genuinely needed. Strong perceptions of influence over life. I can influence what happens to me and I can make good choices. Strong intrapersonal skills. I understand my emotions and develop self-discipline and self-control. Strong intra interpersonal skills. The ability to work with others and develop friendships through communication, cooperating, negotiating, sharing, emphasizing and listening. Strong systemic skills. I am able to adapt with adaptability, flexibility, and integrity. <clears throat> Strong judgmental skills. The ability to use wisdom and evaluate situations to their appropriate values. How do children develop these skills? When you work outside in the yard, Involve them. Show them how to use the tools that you use in the yard. Show them how to weed. It sounds to you something that comes automatically, but children have to learn all those things. And if you work with them, they learn how to do it. When you wash the dishes and dry them, show them how to do it. And then they learn how to do it. They get involved. If you work in the yard, show them how to clean, how to clean the yard and use the tools. When you prepare food, show them how you wash the food, how you prepare the food and how you do it. And when you plant little seeds, show them how you plant them, how you water them and let them do them. By doing those things, they, do have, they gain a lot of good. The Journal of Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics says, the experts believe doing chores at home help children to develop the self-confidence which drives academic, social and career success. But children who really help are likely to be dissatisfied with life. 
Discipline is a beautiful concept. It makes children capable and gives them confidence to live life to its fullest. By your loving guidance, guidance you equip them for life. Most children have the potential to become successful. By using the significant seven perceptions and skills, you allow your children the strength and empowerment to go from strength to strength. Are you familiar with the five love languages from Gary Chapman? Words of affirmation, affirm your children, thank them, listen to them, encourage them, appreciate what they do. And on page 55, you will read what is the difference between praise and encouragement. Touch. We all, we each one of us have a primary love language. During the first four years of a child's life, you treat your children with all five of those love languages. And later you discover what their love language is. If they like touch, they will touch you a lot. They will complain about that the most and they will talk about that the most. This is how you determine which is their love language. Physical affection, hugs, kisses, hold hands, and the body language that you display. Acts of kindness, little things that you do for them. You help them with the chores or little things that they need to be, to be done. Quality time, some people's love language is quality time. You take one-on-one -on -one talks. You walk together. You have special time together. And the last one is gift. And if you don't have to give expensive gifts. But if you go somewhere, even if you just bring a little stone and tell them, while I was there, I was thinking of you and I brought this stone to, rem to tell you that I was thinking of you. Family meetings is a wonderful thing that you can use in your home. It is not just something you do now and then, but it's something you do every week. It is something that you learn how to do it, because if you don't do it correctly, you are going to not do it for a long time. But you can use this as a tool to solve your discipline problems. You can use this to do your family planning. You can use this to do many things, and children learn such a lot from it. In page 70, Four, you will read more about it and you will also read the benefits that it has for your children. There are eight building blocks for family meetings. You must sit around a clear table or in a circle where you can each one see each other. You start by giving compliments, appreciation and acknowledgement. This isn't easy in the beginning, but later it becomes something that they get used to. It is important that each one tells something to somebody in that circle what they appreciate from them. You can create an agenda during the week and only the things that are on the agenda you ex discuss at your family meeting. And you put a paper on the fridge and don't discuss things that were not on the agenda. Leave it for next week. Learn to, they learn to communicate. You talk with respect and we listen, learn to listen, learn distinct realities. We are all unique and so different and we have different views. We solve problems by role playing and brainstorming, apply logical consequences and non-punitive solutions. Do something special after the meeting. Go for a pizza, go out for a pizza or play a little game together or have dessert do something fun. There was a family. The father had his children, the mother had his children, they had children together. And the mother was working outside, but every day when she came back, the house was all upside down. Books were lying everywhere, clothes and shoes, and it upset her greatly. So she took it to the family meeting. And there at the family meeting, the children decided on a deposit box. Everybody that sees something lying around could put it in the deposit, deposit box. And in the deposit box, it had to stay for a whole week. And the children kept the rules. The parents kept the rules. They all worked together. And a wonderful thing happened in that family. There are something like natural and logical consequences. 
Natural consequences, anything that happens naturally. When you stand in the rain, you get wet. When you don't eat, you get hungry. When you forget your coat, you get cold. No need to say anything. Children realize naturally from experience. You may show empathy and encourage. Logical consequences needs the intervention of a parent. The kind of consequences could create a helpful learning experience. It is most effective when children have been involved in advance in deciding the consequences that would be most effective to help them to learn. A first grader forgot his lunch every day and then the school had to call his mama to bring the his food. And then after a day or two, his mama said, we, I'm not going to bring your food. If you rem don't remember your food, you have to go without it. So he went to the teacher and the teacher lent him some money. And the next day, the mommy talked to the teacher and the teacher didn't lend him any money. But a kind little friend shared his sandwich with him, but it wasn't enough. The next day, he remembered his lunch and he even made his lunch himself. When is it not practical to use logical? When the child is in danger? When it interferes with the rights of others? And when behavior does not seem like a problem to them, then it will be ineffective. Connect is a wonderful concept. You will read more of it at page 95 and onwards. A loving connection gets wired into the brain. Every member is empowered. Their needs are met, their voices heard. Parents guide with love, help, obey rules, have routines and discipline structures. It is all about relationships, built relationships. Connection is a, a first step to discipline and it's a powerful tool. Here is an image of two brains, which the Professor Bruce Perry showed. He is from Texas. The one, the smaller one, is the abusive childhood brain from a child who was abused during childhood. And the other one was the one that was nurtured and had a healthy brain. What is discipline? Discipline is a journey. It's a journey of love. It's not a destination or a technique, and there's no success recipe for it. We are all so different, and each child is different and needs different approach. It simply is an act of love. The, first, the hardest part of any journey is taking that first step. A little step may be the beginning of a great journey.